Oh, let's give the Lord a great hand clap. God, I love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, we love you. We love you. We love you. We love you. God, we love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory. Hallelujah. Oh, we love you, Jesus. My, my, my. I feel a good, good presence of the Lord here. I appreciate all of the very, very kind words. I, um, I know a, number, a lot of people I wish was here to hear that. Praise God. <laughs> but, amen. But uh, anyway, great to be in the house of the Lord and to feel his presence. I love God and I love his people. Can you say amen? amen. We appreciate Brother and Sister Reed in this church hosting this camp. Um, trust me, I really do know there is a, a lot of work that goes into this. An unbelievable amount of effort and finance and uh, sleep, little sleep-filled nights in order to, uh, to pull off a camp like this and to have food afterwards and, and provide for a good setting for all this good fellowship. That's no small thing. And I'll tell you one thing, it makes you appreciate the marriage supper of the Lamb. And I don't know who's going to work to fix that, but it's not going to be us. Praise God. So we're, we're, we're excited about all of it. Good to be here with so many friends. Amen. People that I've known through the years and grown to love and appreciate very, very, very deeply. Amen. I'd like for you, if you would, to turn with me to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter number 17. 1 Samuel, chapter number 17. It's good to be in this meeting with Brother Todd Nance. This man loves God. That is his single greatest accolade that I can give him. He loves God and he is a Christian. Amen. But coupled with that, he deeply loves his word. And I don't see how you can love God without loving his word. And, uh, and he loves to discuss it. He loves he loves to share it. He loves to preach it, teach it. He loves to live it. Amen. And I count it an honor to, uh, to share this time with him. I truly respect Brother Todd Nance tremendously. So it's good to be here. Praise God. I'm, 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 I'm happy. I feel at home. I feel good in my soul. Praise God. I got, uh, the facilities are very, very nice. I, I'm laying on a brand new king size, exceedingly comfortable bed. It was hard arising, but I made it. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so just, just don't get much better than this. God's good to us. Can you say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. Amen. Okay. We're going to begin reading with verse number 34 of 1 Samuel chapter number 17. Amen. Forgive me, I don't mean to torment you. I really don't. This is better than I'm making it out to be. It really is. That's really good. Praise God. Well, I won't, I won't put more on you than you can bear. I'll put it down here. Amen. 1 Samuel 17, beginning with verse 34. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went after him, and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing as he hath defied the armies of the living God. 
David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, go and the Lord be with thee. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we are mindful of you. And God, we recognize our need of you so very, 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 very deeply. Touch us, God. Teach us, God. Mold us, God. Make us, God. Lead us and guide us in this house tonight. Oh, God, touch every man, every single man, every single woman, every young person, God. Lord, every child, give us ears to hear what your word and spirit would speak in Jesus' name tonight. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, praise the Lord. God bless you so much. You may be seated. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Uh, I don't know who this is for tonight. It may be very much for me, and, uh, and I'm not aware of it. Amen. I know that without a shadow of a doubt, in days gone by, I wish I would have had someone preach this to me. I know that I have drawn from it, and I know, again, without, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that I will need what I'm about to bring to you. If what I'm bringing uh, does not exactly, if it's not the shoe that fits your foot exactly tonight, please don't throw this away. Put it in your medicine chest. Uh, you'll need it. You will need it. But whether you need it now or not, and I trust you've already been making application of this message that I'm going to preach, but if you've been a little lax or a little less than diligent, then I pray that tonight at the conclusion we will begin, all of us together, amen, to as much as is humanly and, of course, divinely possible, and it, everything's possible with him, that we will get this in our hearts and act upon it. Not because of anything I have to say, but simply because it is the word of the Lord. This message was uh, birthed in my heart back in October of 2003. I live in the state of California on the way here today from Jackson, riding with Brother Reed and Brother Nance. We discussed some of California, and I told them that it is a wonderful, wonderful place to live. If you can overlook the uh, earthquakes and the uh, fires and the droughts and then the floods and the red tape and the taxes and the uh, homosexuals and uh, the gangs and the traffic and the smog, um, it's a really great place to live. Amen. And... Uh, and believe it or not, I, I really can't imagine myself living anywhere else. I, I really can't. It's crazy. But uh, there we are. And uh, where I live right now has just come out in the papers that it is the fastest growing area in the entire nation. And I read that and I thought, are they talking about building or devils? But anyway, whatever. And... Uh, but I got this message birthed back in 2003, October, because you may possibly remember, but back then we were in a terrible state of, uh, of arson-induced fires around Southern California. And in fact, where I lived, there were three main fires that when they finally burned and burned until they combined there was a 40-mile stretch of fire, and you could see it all from my house, many, many, many miles of it. In fact, on one given night 
where the area of town where I live, uh, 29 families from our church had to leave that area. And we had to camp out down at the church house. And there we were. People had their cats down there and their dogs. And, and uh, truly, I, I woke up the next morning not knowing if I had a house or not. Come to find out we did. Thank the Lord for his mercy. And uh, nobody in our church lost anything by the mercies of Almighty God. Amen. Amen. One, uh, one young man who was a new convert, he was on his rooftop and uh, he had a little hose and fire was everywhere. And just as a, something like a bomb burst of a flame and it come landing on his shake roof. And he's standing there and he knew, not only is my house going to be burned up, I'm going to go with it. And while he was standing there, uh, he said, in Jesus' name. And the next thing he knew, and he was standing there in a puff of white, and a helicopter had just dropped a big douse. And he he looked like a skinny Pillsbury doughboy, and he was jumping up and down thanking Jesus. Hallelujah. God's a good God. He's a good God. But in the process of all of those fires, I have a friend who lives up the road about five or six miles in an area that is called Lytle Creek. And uh, Lytle Creek is a strange area. It is strange because of all the strange people that live there. And and I kid you not, it's it's, it's a throwback to to the 60s. And... uh, At any rate, there is a man there by the name of Al. Al is a friend of mine. He is in his late 70s. He is a Greek scholar. Um, He loves to discuss scripture. He's not real honest with it. But he likes to discuss it. And and I like him, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And back where he was, was the worst of the worst of our local area of fire. And they blocked off. No one could get in and out of Lytle Creek unless they happened to live there. The reports were coming out that it was destroyed. There was many, many, many homes that were destroyed. Before those fires were over, 3,300 homes burned up. 3,300. And some were saying it was the worst disaster since the San Francisco earthquake of 1906. And I didn't know if Al was alive or dead. Finally, one day I pulled up to the stand. They were not letting anyone through. And I went up to the police officer and I said, Sir, I've got a friend of mine that lives back there. And I don't know if he's alive or dead. And if you will, please let me through. And he said, Okay, I'm closing my eyes. You drive on. Don't tell anybody I let you in. Etc. So I drove back up there. There was a home destroyed here, a home destroyed there, home destroyed here. And I pulled up to Al's ramshackle house. And he came out and he was smiling from ear to ear. And fire was everywhere around him or had been. You could see it. I got out of my car. I said, Al, I didn't know if you were alive or dead. We conversed conversed a little bit, and he said, come with me. We went up to the far back area of his property, and he showed me what seemed to be a seemingly useless road. He said, you see this this graded road here? I said, yes. And you could see the fire stopped right there, and it was about 10, 12 feet wide. And he said, look at that real well. He said, now come to this side of my property. And there was another stretch graded out. There were some trees. There was, and then around the front. And he had, he had protected himself. And he said, Larry, he said, I have lived here in this spot for 45 years. He said, over 30 years ago, I looked at these mountains and I said, Someday, this will all 
be going up in flames. And he said, 30 years ago, I bought that, and it was a very, very old uh, grater, diesel grater. He said, 30 years ago, I bought that. And he said, I graded that, and I cut this down, and I cut those hedges, and I did this. And, and he made this statement. He said, I have planned for this fire for 30 years. I planned for this fire for 30 years. And if there's a title I want to put on what I want to talk to us about tonight, I want to talk about I planned for this fire for 30 years. Amen. Somewhere in the course of life, there's going to be a fire. There's going to be a catastrophe. There's going to be a problem. There's going to be a trial. There's going to be a circumstance or circumstances. There's going to be situations that will arise. You will feel the heat. You will feel the pain. You will feel the sorrow. You will feel the agony. You will feel the self-doubt. You will feel the powers of hell breathing down the back of your neck. Yea, maybe staring you in the eyes may be ripping your heart out of your chest and you will be in some type of a spiritual firestorm of your life. I have no doubt there is somebody that is in that kind of a circumstance in your soul even as I speak tonight. But I have a word for you tonight and I have a word for all of us tomorrow. There needs to be something in us that says I will prepare for that fire. I will prepare against that day. When it comes, I will be ready. Hallelujah. There will be something. It does not mean that I may not be frightened. It doesn't mean that I may not be rocked. It doesn't mean that I may not be shaken. But somehow, when all of the dust settles and all of the smoke has lifted and all of the flames slowly go out, I'll still be here. Hallelujah. And I'll still be standing. And I'll still be walking. And I'll still be talking. And my God will still be on the throne of my heart. Because I planned for this fire years ago. Hallelujah. Amen. There is a poem that I learned over 30 years ago. I change one word in it. It says, I to my perils of cheat and charmer came clad in armor by stars benign. Luck lies to others and most believer, but man's deceiver was never mine. The thoughts of others were light and fleeting of lovers meeting or luck or fame, but mine were of trouble and mine were steady. So I was ready when trouble came. There needs to be something that though we are not cynical, though we are not dour, though we are not biting our nails, and though we know the goodness of the Lord surrounds us, we are camped about with an innumerable company of angels. He lady, he daily loadeth us with benefits. Hallelujah. We bless the Lord at all times. His praise is continually in our mouth. Hallelujah. There is nothing that keeps us down and sour and bitter and, and in trepidation. Yet at the same time, we know that life has a way of visiting us. We know that days will come when the sun does not shine. Amen. The days will come. Amen. When the clouds grow thick and the light grows dim and the days will come when the nights grow cold. Amen. And the heart feels like stone becoming dead in sorrow and pain. And there's something in those hours. Amen. That's got to rise up and say, no, 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 no. I prepared for this fire years ago. Hallelujah. I knew somewhere, someplace, sometime it was going to be darker and bleaker and sadder than others. So I made up my mind a long time ago. There are some principles I'm going to get in my gut. There are some things we're going to get down in our soul. There are some scriptures we're going to embed into our hearts. Amen. There's some promises that are going to be in my mind and in my mouth. And when the fire comes, when it's all said and done, honey, I'll still be there. I'll be there for my children. I'll be there for my grandkids. I'll be there for the church of the living God. I'll be there for my brothers. I'll be there for my sisters because I planned for this fire for 30 years. Hallelujah. Others may be blown away and others may be burnt up and others may be swept away, but somewhere we made up our mind. We're not going anywhere. 
except upward and onward with him. Let's lift our hands and talk to him just a second. I love you, Jesus. 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 I love you, God. I love you, God. Sandra, I need just a little more here. In the text that we've read to you, David is just a young man. He's a young man. He has yet to deal with so many problems that will come his way. Internal problems, external problems, familial problems, amen, political problems, problems, amen, that, that would all but drown him. But this example that's given to us in this, in this 17th chapter, amen, is, is as good a type as any when it comes to David. How that regardless of what would come or go, high or low, good, bad, sad, or mad, somehow something would rise up in David and he could make it through. In this text, we know he is dealing with, about to deal with Goliath. Somehow King Saul was not prepared for that hour. The entire army of Israel, including his elder brothers, were not prepared mentally, spiritually, emotionally, courageously for that hour. But this young man had been preparing for that fire. Amen. He didn't realize that he'd be fighting a giant one day, but he was out on the hillside. And there he was defending his father's flock. He would feed them. He would lead them. He would guide them. He would take them beside the still waters of their lives. He was good to them. No doubt he would scratch their ears one at a time. They'd make their way to and from him just to feel the shepherd's touch. He went through it all. But one day he heard the low, low growl that ever shepherd hates to hear. And somewhere he picked up and perceived that danger was in the midst. And somewhere he understood that one of his sheep were about to be taken. He saw that it was a kid of the flocks. It was but a little lamb. A little lamb, a little lamb. A lamb so little that probably his father didn't even know it had been born yet. Probably had no accounting made of it yet. And as small as it was, as young as it was, he would have never been called into question for that day, not by his father. Had he just turned an eye and looked another way and pretended that it wasn't happening. The lion would have snatched the kid and taken it. And they'd been none the worse as far as his father was concerned. But somewhere in his heart, he knew that's not the way you prepare for life. Young people, I want you to hear me. You cannot prepare for life by turning the blinded eyes to the challenges that they give you, even as a young person. You may as well take up, amen, the challenge in your youth. It's good. Jeremiah said, for a man to bear the yoke in his youth. It's good, amen, to get under the burden. It's good to get the principles down. I don't care what my friends are doing. I don't care if mom and dad will never know. I don't care. It doesn't matter. There's something in me that says, God, by your grace, by your grace, we're not going to let this slide. I'm going to rise above this. We're not going to live this way. We're not going to go there. We're not going to act that way. I'd like to stop here and make an observation in the world and society that we're living in. I do hope you realize that almost everything in our nation and world is succumbing to hell and the powers of hell. Almost every aspect of whatever political party you want to believe in is succumbing to the powers of hell. The corruption, the vileness, the gross immorality that runs rampant. If there's a politician that keeps it clean, God bless him. I'm glad. I'm thankful. But the picture is very dour and bleak indeed. What 
party, honey, is going to pull us out of the mess we're in. Amen. I hope you realize that the education world of America, especially from the college level up, but it's working its way down to the smallest kindergartens, amen, are slowly but surely and absolutely and thoroughly succumbing to the powers of hell, of atheism, amen, agnosticism, of, of, of cynicism of coldness, of indifference, of mockery. Amen. And, 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 and uh, 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 the, the concepts of creationism being laughed at and evolution being vaunted, that's just the tip of an iceberg that is so grotesque and horrid because education is succumbing to hell. I do trust you realize the entertainment world has gone to hell in a handbasket that the Hollywood television industry is spewing out of hell. In fact, I'll even stop here, amen, enough to say, when we look at the Middle East and its problems and the Muslim countries that hate us with deep, deep passion and they refer to us as the great Satan, I was in long conversation with a Middle Eastern Pastor, amen, one of our missionaries. And he told me, he said, Brother Booker, you have to understand the reason they call us the great Satan. It is not just because we have been a traditional friend of Israel. That's a part of it. But there's been other nations that have been Israel's friend, not as, not as devoted as we've been, but they do not refer to them as the great Satan. Why do they call us the great Satan? Israel's one. Number two. Everything, granted, highly hypocritical, but the Muslim world is against America's for. When you look at, at least verbally they're against, the sexual immorality, the, 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 the illicit liaisons in the marriage vows, yea, open, brazen homosexuality, lesbianism, all of those things that are an effrontery to any kind of halfway decent thinking person, America spews it out over the whole world wholesale. And Hollywood and television, we are the ones that push it all over the entire world. I could stop right here and give you a long litany of nations that have been so deeply affected. And this one, this pastor I was talking to, he said, I remember in, in Jordan, in Amman, Jordan, when television in Jordan was outlawed. I wish I'd have kept a diary of watching when they finally succumbed to the pressures and they allowed television to come in. And I could tell you what happened within six months. The boom boxes and the punky kids standing on the corners and the girls walking around looking like street walkers. He said, it was not like that before. They call us the great Satan because of the styles, the dress, the immodesty, the, the, the alcohol, the tobacco, everything. It spews out of America. Why do you think they call us the great Satan? And it blows my mind when everything is succumbing. The music world has succumbed to hell. The religious world has succumbed to hell. Do you understand the only thing in the world that has not succumbed to the power of hell is the one God, Jesus name, apostolic holiness movement? It's the only thing left. It's the only thing in the entire world that has not succumbed to hell. And people wonder why I get upset when I see parts of that succumbing to hell. We've got to stand strong. We've got to be true. We've got to be righteous. And the fire is on and the storm is raging. But there's got to be something inside that says, no, 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 no. I prepared for this fire for years. I prepared for this storm. We've got some things down. We've got them established. We're not going to burn up and we're not going to turn out. We're going to stand strong. And my God will be the same yesterday, today, and forever. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
David fought the lions and the bears. And when the fire of the storm of Goliath came, I've planned for you for years. I didn't know your name. I didn't know what your face looked like. I wasn't sure of the circumstance of the time, but I knew you were coming. And when all his brethren and all the men running and fleeing, and then the king says, you're but a kid. This man's been fighting since he was a youth, and you're going to stand against him. I planned for this fire for years. My God helped me with a lion one day, and my God helped me with a bear, and that same God is on the throne today, and that same God is here, and that same God will be in the battlefield, and before this day is over, I will remove the head of that uncircumcised Philistine, and then he spoke prophetically that all the world will know that God ruleth in the heavens. And here we are, amen, 3,600 years later, and we're still talking. I'm telling you, all the world knows about David. God saw to it that all the world would know that you can prepare for the fire. You can stand. You can be strong. You can take it. You can make it. You don't have to succumb. You don't have to give up. You don't have to have a pity party. You don't have to cash in the chips. You don't have to walk away. You don't have to go around being a belly aker about the, the sorrows and trials that were told you. I'm here to tell you there's enough grace in this house to see you all the way to glory. There's enough God in this house. He'll see you through to the end. Hallelujah. Come on, sir. Come on, ma'am. You prepared for this fire for years. One day, Joseph interpreted a dream for Pharaoh. Basically, for the sake of this message, he said, Sir, there's a storm coming, and you'd better prepare for it. God's given you seven years to prepare for this storm. I know about storms. I've had brothers who helped prepare me for storms. I've had Midianites that were involved in Ishmaelites and a man named Potiphar and his blessed wife. I know what it is to be prepared for the storms of life. And if you'll walk Pharaoh correctly, you're going to make it through the storm with flying colors. Pharaoh looked around and he said, who better to take us through the storm than somebody like this? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And they prepared, and they made it through. This is why James said it so well. My brethren, come on now, count it all joy when you fall into different kinds of temptations, knowing that the trying of your faith works patience. Let patience have a perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire and wanting nothing when the storms come. Hallelujah. When the trials arise, there is something that says, I know my God is on the throne. I know my God is able. That's why in Job 1 and 6 now there was a day. Everybody say a day. Can I change it this way? Now there came a day. And somewhere, someplace, sometime there always comes a day. When his day came, the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came with them. And we know the story. I could have positioned a young man at each corner of this auditorium and had them come running. The Bible said that when the first came and he spoke, uh, the exact sequence I, I don't uh, have in my brain, but here came the Sabaeans and they killed the servants and they took all the camels. While he was yet speaking, here came another, and here came the Chaldeans, and they took the oxen and the asses. And then here came another, and said, uh, I saw fire fall from heaven, and, while, and burned up all your servants and all your sheep. And while he was yet speaking, here came another, and said, I saw, amen, a great wind fall upon the house that killed all the servants, every son, every daughter. While one was speaking, another came. Had I positioned them in this auditorium, we could have got the whole story 
in less than 60 seconds. I'm telling you, one phone call, less than 60 seconds can turn your world upside down and inside out. Hallelujah. But I'm also telling you, there is a God that sitteth in the heavens. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He said, I'm the Lord, and I change not. In him is neither variableness nor shadow of turning. Hallelujah. This is the God that said, that's why you're not consumed, because I never change. I never change. Let God be true, but every man a liar, every trial a liar, every circumstance a liar. My God will see you through. There's got to be something that you prepare. There's got to be something that you make up your mind. There's got to be something that says, I will tie a knot at the end of my rope but I'm going to go through because my God is big and my God is mighty and my God is powerful and my God will help me I prepared for this fire for years hallelujah that's why he said oh, I know that my redeemer liveth hallelujah and I'm going to stand in the latter days and I'm going to see him hallelujah that's why he said though he slay me yet will I trust him that's why he said hallelujah though after the skin worms destroy this body yet in my flesh I shall see God I'll see him for myself my eyes will behold him not another my God is true my God God is mighty. My God is holy. And I prepared for this fire for years. And he made it. And if Job made it, ain't nobody under the sound of my voice. I don't know how many tears you'll shed tonight before you go to sleep. But I'm here to tell you, I got a word for you. You'll make it. You're going to make it. You're going to make it. Hang in there, baby. Don't give up. Hang in there. In your own way, shape, form, and time, you've been preparing for this fire, and my God will see you through. You say, that don't really fit me tonight. Good. Then listen very, very closely and put it in your medicine chest because somewhere, someplace, sometime, there will come a day. Oh, hallelujah. My God will see you through just like he saw Job through. And when he saw Job through, he had twice as much as he had before he lived to be 175 years old and he saw new sons and daughters to the fourth generation I'm telling you God's good I'm telling you God's mighty I'm telling you God's holy I'm telling you my God is a good God Paul knew about the storms Five times of the Jews I got 40 stripes save one. Three times they beat me with rods. Once they stoned me. Three times I suffered shipwreck. A day and a night I was in the deep. I've been in journeyings often. Perils of waters. Perils of robbers. Perils of my own countrymen. Perils of heathen. City. Wilderness. Perils of the sea. Perils of false brethren. I've been in weariness. Painfulness. Watchings. Hunger. Thirst. Fastings. Cold. Naked. Besides everything that was without. Every day comes upon me. The care of all the churches. And for which cause I suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him against that day. I have prepared for this fire for years. Hallelujah. Somewhere you stop and you make up your mind. Live, die, sink, or swim. It doesn't matter what comes or goes. Somewhere, some way, somehow, my God, you and I are making it through. We're going to do it. We're going to be there when everything comes and everything goes. My God will be true and everything else will be false because he is mighty and he is powerful and he is holy how do you prepare for one thing if we say we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness we're not preparing we're lying to ourselves and we're not doing the truth this is how we prepare if we walk in the light as he is in the light two things happen one we have fellowship one with another two 
the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. It's a continual cleansing. Just by simply walking with him continually, day by day, we have fellowship one with another. If you walk in the light, as he is in the light. Thank God for fellowship. I don't, now listen, in one sense of the word, we go through our trials alone, in one sense. But in another sense, what a family. What an unbelievable family of God. My, my wife, by way of good report, the doctors have Declared she is 100% cancer free. It's all done. It's over. Hallelujah. She underwent the surgery. She told me, she said, honey, I, I know this sounds crazy. She said, I had discomfort, but I never actually had pain. Not real pain. The day they let her out of the hospital, she quit taking all the pain medicine. She said, I, ne- I had discomfort, but I never really had pain. She did go through radiation. All of that's through. She's getting stronger every day. The most beautiful thing of all, I stand amazed at the cards and the letters and the phone calls. What a family. What a family. What does the world do? How do they bear it with no fellowship? They may have, but there's a difference between friendship and fellowship. And walking in the light as he is in the light. And knowing that because we do that, it brings us fellowship. And there is a continual cleansing of the blood. It's like if you get a cut on your foot, automatically the white blood cells start working their way down there in copious amounts working against infection. You don't realize it. You don't stop. You don't consider. It just does it. It comes with the turf. Hallelujah. And can I propose to you that the blood of Jesus Christ works the same way? The same way. The same way. That's why when you're going down the road and and somebody cuts you off, boom, almost hits you. And you say, Hey, man, you crazy? During those five, ten seconds that you uttered those words, that doesn't mean you're lost. I'm not talking about cussing. You just, hey, hey, hey. It doesn't mean you're lost. But I'm going to tell you what happens if you're walking in the light. It's easy in the light. Automatically the blood starts rushing to that area and to your heart and to your mind. That's why you don't go through your days Saved 8 a.m., lost from 8 to 8.05. Saved from 8.05 to 8.30. Lost from 8.30 to 8.35. It don't work that way. Because there's a continual cleansing of his blood. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship. And the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood. Hallelujah. In walking in the light, we're preparing for that fire. We're preparing for that storm. There's something about being ensconced in the glory and the goodness and the love and the mercy. Can I tell you, those of you that are in a deep trial and trough of sorrow right now, the blood is fighting in your behalf. The blood is rushing to your situation. The blood is being poured in in copious amounts. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. I'm telling you, my God is on the throne and he's here to help you. Hallelujah. There's got to be something, brother. Ronnie Mullings, California. Good man, friend of mine. I remember when his boy, who's in his 30s now, I remember when he was 16 and he was struck with what the doctor said was terminal leukemia. Brother Mullings told me the other day, he said, Brother Booker, he said it was the saddest, most grievous, horrid, darkest moments of my life. I don't know whose faith got him through it. He said, but I don't think mine did because I felt like I had been knocked off my feet completely. 
I was standing next to what I thought was the dying side of my son. And he looked up at me and said, Well, Dad, this is where we live what you've been preaching all these years. You know what that 16-year-old boy was saying? Daddy, give or take, live or die, we've prepared for this storm for years. And somehow, we're going to make it through. Hallelujah. I'm going through to glory or I'm going through living in this life. But we're going to go through. It's going to be all right, Dad. And he said he took strength from a 16-year-old boy. Can I tell you something? It pays to preach to your kids. It pays to put, it pays to put good things into your family. Because someday you're going to need it. Someday it'll come back to bless you. Come on, Pastor. Keep on preaching. Keep on believing. Keep on trusting. It'll come back. It'll come back. Cast your bread upon the waters. Give a portion of seven and an eight. Prepare for the storm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Musicians come. There is a famous castle, parts of which can be seen to this day. It's on the spur of the Syrian desert. It's called the Croc de Chevalier. It was built by the Crusaders in the 11th century. It's on the spur of the Syrian desert. It took, listen to me now, 150 years to build it. Two outer walls of protection against the Muslims. It was built on a steep hill. The road to the front gate had literal hairpin terms, which no battering ram or catapult could approach. The other side had an 80 foot deep, 20 foot wide hand dug ravine that was filled completely with huge rocks through which nobody could dig a tunnel. Nobody. Two walls. They had water supplies and food supplies that could sustain for one year, which was plenty of time for reinforcements to arrive. It withstood 12 Saracen attempts to overthrow it. Even the great Saladin could not overthrow the Croc de Chevalier. It was impregnable. It was indomitable. It was indestructible for that day and time. After a great siege in 1271 of many months, Sultan Baber called the Panther. He was getting nowhere. And he was just about to give up and be number 13. When a little idea got in his brain and he got a passenger pigeon and he attached a note to it written in the crusader's tongue. And the pigeon flew around and it landed on the walls of the Croc de Chevalier. And when they unfolded the note, the note said, no help coming. Surrender. Four words. No help coming, surrender. Let's all stand. Four words. You may as well give up. You may as well throw in the towel. You may as well forget it. There's no fellow crusaders coming to help you. They had months and months left of provisions and water. Sultan Baber was all but spent, about to give up. And four words of discouragement. Within 24 hours, they rolled up the white flag and Croc de Chevalier fell to the Muslims. And when they realized 
It was a lie. It was a ruse. The shame. The shame of being so foolish was unbearable. I, 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 I got a word for somebody. The devil is a liar and the father of lies. How can you tell he's lying? Because he's talking. And when he tells you there's no way out, and he tells you you may as well give up, and he tells you, no, 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 no. I'm here to tell you there's an innumerable company of angels. There is a mighty God in the heavens. All things work to the good to them that love God, who are the called according to his purpose. I got a word for you tonight. You got to hang in there, baby. I got a word for you tonight. Don't give up. I got a word for you. Come on now. My God's true. My God's mighty. He will not fail you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My God's big. That's why we put on the whole armor of God that we may withstand in the evil day when the fire's raging and the storm's howling and the doubts are sailing. You don't give up. And I'm closing. I had a preacher friend of mine. He told me about a little lady in Arkansas years ago. She had a husband that was considered a hopeless, wretched, pitiful alcoholic. And one night, her pastor preached you got a picture in your mind what you're praying for and never give up. Hang in there and don't ever stop. So, they had no money. He wore rags because he drank up everything. He worked, but just, she took a little side job. She saved her pennies. When she'd find one on sale, she'd buy a suit. She'd buy a shirt. She'd buy a tie. When she began to get a little extra here and there, she'd find a pair of shoes on sale. She'd buy them. And through the months and through the years, she'd collect these suits and these ties and these shirts his shoes and then she got to where she'd come to church with a little white sack and she'd go to sit down and she'd lay a suit out next to her the pants and the coat and sometimes she'd put a pair of shoes down there sometimes she'd even have a white shirt underneath it and sometimes she'd have a tie not always People would say, what are you doing? She said, that's where my husband's going to sit one of these days. And that's the suit he's going to wear. And the years came and the years went. And one day they were driving down the road and he was going to take her somewhere else but church that night. And at the wheel, he started crying. And at the wheel, he started sobbing. And he pulled over to the side of the road and he said, Baby, my world has come off its hinges. I'm sorry what I've put you through. I should have lived for God years ago. She started talking to him. And he said, Honey, I... I'd go to church tonight, but look at me. And I ain't got a better piece of clothes in the house. She said, honey, can we go by the house just a moment? Sorrowfully, sadly, pitifully, he, he drove home. She said, come on in the house with me, baby. Come on in the house. Went to an unused closet as far as he was concerned. She opened it up. She started removing some covering. And there was nine suits. 
There was a rack of ties. There were shoes. There were shirts. She said, take your pick, baby. I've been planning for this for a long time. <laughs> Crying, weeping. He showered, put on that suit. They was late for church. When they come walking in, that church was... And they came down to where she sat. And now in flesh and bone, inside that suit, was what she'd been believing God for for all them years. And before that night was over, that suit got up from its seat, and that suit went down to the front, and that suit kneeled for the first time in its existence, and he prayed and cried and wept. He was baptized in Jesus' name, and a few nights later, he got the Holy Ghost, and he lived for God till the day he died. Can I tell you, she prepared for years. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. I'm here to tell you I got good news for you. My God's still on the throne. My God still loves you. My God knows where you are. And wherever you are right now, and whoever you are, and again, if this isn't for you, put it in your medicine chest. But I highly recommend... Anybody and everybody get a hold and say, God, I'm coming down there tonight and I'm putting this in my medicine chest or I'm coming down and I'm tying a knot in the end of my rope. But God, I've prepared for this fire for years and I'm not going to be washed out now. My God is going to see me through. Hallelujah. 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 And I am, I promise. You may wonder, you know, my pastor, he just Tell him I'm down in blue and he keeps just saying, no, you're going to make it. You, you're going to be all right. Just hang in there. You do. One last story. A young black man, tremendous fighter. He was in the fight of his life. If he passed this muster, he might have a chance for the big ones. But he was in the fight of his life. He seemed like he was being beat six ways from Sunday, round after round after round. Finally, the bell rang. He falls into the corner. He had a manager by the name of Angelo. Angelo comes, shoots the water in his face, wiping his face. You got to move to the left. You got to move to the left. Pull him out. Pull him out. And then hit him. Pull him out. You got to move to the left. Cut the gloves, Angelo. I can't take no more. I'm telling you. And when he starts doing this, you move this way. You move. The, I'm telling you. Listen to me. Listen to me. Cut the gloves, Angelo. I can't take it anymore. And then you move. You move. You move. And you go. And the bell rang. Cut the gloves, Angelo. Angelo Dundee picked him up and shoved him into the middle of the ring. And before his name was Muhammad Ali, Cassius Clay went into the middle of the ring. In the fight of his life, standing there, the only thing going for him was a manager that kept shoving him into the ring. I'm not letting you give up. I'm not letting you turn out. I'm not letting you throw in the towel. You got to hang in there, baby. And while Cassius Clay stood there weaving, all of a sudden, in his peripheral vision, he saw something floating down from the, thought it was the ceiling. It was a white towel that landed at his feet. He thought Angelo did it.
But he realized the other fighter's manager threw in the towel. And Cassius Clay was on his way to being the world champion. I got one last blessed word. Your pastor is not going to throw in the towel. That's why he pushes you. That's why he shoves you. Come on, get out there. Get out there and fight. Don't give up. Don't give up. Hang in there. Move out to the right. Move out to the right. Come out to the altar. Come out, come out, come out. Don't give up. Find a place to pray. Keep going, keep going. My God's going to see you through. And that's why we're here tonight. And that's why this altar is open right now. If you don't need this right now, then I suggest you get it in your medicine chest. If you happen to need this right now, come on down. Hallelujah. Whoever you are, wherever you are, make up your mind. I'm going to go all the way. I'm going all the way to the end. I'm not stopping. I'm not going to the left. I'm not going to the right. I'm going to be everything my God wants me to be and do. Come on now. Come on, mama. Come on, daddy. There may be somebody here, you know somebody that's going through it and you want to come pray for them. But I'm telling you, you need to come and say, God, here's my heart. Here's my mind. Here's my soul. Here's my spirit. I'm going through with you, Jesus. I'm making it all the way. I'm going to the glory land. I'm not turning around. There's no discharge in this war. Hallelujah. I'm pressing on. I'm pressing on. I'm pre- come on, sir. Come on, mama. Come on, daddy. There's a good God in this house. Come on, brother pastor. Come on, sister pastor's wife. Come on, mama. Come on, mama. We've planned for this fire for 30 years. We're not turning around now. And it reaches to the Young lady, come on, God's reaching for you. God loves you tonight. It will never